Hey, listeners, Dan Harris here, host of the 10% Happier Podcast. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles and originals like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible Originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash Harris or text Harris to 500-500. The weather is cooling down a bit. The leaves are starting to fall. Yes, it's that time of year again. Football season. And we all know the best part of any game day traditions are the ones that involve food. There's nothing like having everyone in your game day crew coming together to bring their best bites and argue over whose family makes the best chili. And while there's no need to mess with the perfection of game day classics, like a freshly grilled Oscar Mayer hot dog topped with Heinz ketchup and mustard, it's always fun to step out of your comfort zone and get creative with your recipes. Because there's nothing more fun than adding to your list of game day traditions, like making a creamy and delectable queso dip with Velveeta cheese that can be eaten with so much more than just chips. Now is the chance for people across the nation to find out whose game day eats reign supreme. It's your turn to show off your tasty game day food traditions. Go to www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to share a photo of your game day food tradition to enter to win $10,000. Once again, that's www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to enter to win $10,000. This is Full Change with Tom Laidlaw. We're back. We have a great guest today. Another one with the Stanley Cup ring, an ex Ranger. Wow. He actually, and hopefully we'll talk about this, he appeared on a postage stamp in Sweden. We have Corey Hirsch. Not for good reasons either. We have Corey Hirsch. Corey Hirsch. What's happening, brother? Ah, Tommy, always good to see you. I do have to correct you, though. I was a roster member of the 94 Stanley Cup champion team. I did not get a ring. Oh, you didn't get I a ring? I was there through the whole process. I was there right to the end, drank out of the cup. You know, I was the Black Ace. So really? we have to we have to set that straight because I would love to accept the fact the Stanley Cup champion, but when you see what the guys did that went through it, Man, yeah, yeah, but you're still there, though. Isn't don't don't guys normally get a ring though? Even if I don't, maybe now, but not back then. That was '94, right? That's right. So, how do you play? No games, right? So that's no, yeah, yeah. That year, I played with the Olympic team and then got called up during the during the playoffs. So, um, pretty cool though to see. But that was also actually the same year I got sick, Tommy. So that's right. It was actually during that run when things kind of went dark for me. I guess would be the. It would right. be the word, and we'll get into that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. definitely. All right, let's start where you growing up there. Where was her home? What hometown? Well, I grew up in Calgary. Well, I was born in a small town called Medicine Ann, Alberta. Oh, it's yeah. Canada, and then I grew up in Calgary um, and uh, played all my minor hockey there. I went to play junior hockey in Kamloops. And, uh, Tommy, I was saying this the other day. I was saying this to some people. So, Scott Niedemeyer was actually one of my defensemen oh. uh, in oh. junior hockey, right? So, where would you put him in the top – in the top – NHL defenseman of all time. I mean, he's got to be top four ahead of Laidlaw. Sure. No, I had I had Tommy two behind Bobby Orr. Would you put him? I'd love him as a player. Would you go that high though? So I've got uh, obviously Bobby Orr, Larry Robinson, um, uh, Dennis Potvin's got to be up there. Dennis Potvin, Ray Bork, right? Ray Bork. Yeah, Lidstrom for sure. Yes, Brian Leach. Brian Leach. Leachy. Yep. Um, Um. Niedermeyer won everything though, right? Like he won every trophy. Yeah. And he was a real good team guy too, right? Like he was a real good team player coming from that New Jersey system, the way he played there. So yeah, certainly, certainly top 10, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, my point there is, is that I played junior hockey with one of the top defensemen ever to play the game. Right. Scott Niedermeyer is a 16 year old was better than everybody in the league. (laughs) So he was, he was that good. Was he, when he was, he was that good. Yeah. And then out of, out of Kamloops, I got drafted by the Rangers. Um, Eighth round pick, eighth round pick. Long shot. 
There wasn't right. too many guys I've, I've, I've beat. I was a six round pick there. So you know, six was, rounder, yeah, eh? six rounders. Well, there used to be what 400 rounds back then. God, I think they, there's no limit. I think they just kept going until there's no player players left. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So you grew up as a kid then when you're a goaltender when you started. I always, always play goalie. So I grew up, I was that kid that uh, drove his parents nuts throwing tennis balls against the wall and pretend oh. I was making saves watching Hockey Night in Canada. Oh, yeah, okay. So, oh. yeah, watched, uh, we used to get the Leafs or Montreal. Uh, right. Those were the two games we got. So um, who's, your, who's your favorite goalie then? Well, it was Mike Palmatier. Oh, so, right. And I golf with Palmy now, so he's a oh. friend of mine. So it's oh. him and his brother. We're, we're like, we have our, our little golf group in the summer. So That's right. Like, him and Wayne Thomas were together, weren't they? Wasn't Wayne Thomas I, there at the I, same time? I don't know. Yeah, they either that or Washington. Was Wayne Thomas in Washington? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, they might, they might yeah. have. Well, I know they would have played against each other. Yeah, so. definitely. But, definitely. So were you pretty good right away? Uh, yeah. You know what? It, it, that's the thing I, I was uh, – like I always had that athletic ability right. and you always see, if you ask most guys that have played, they're just like, and you know, I mean, we're supposed to, we're, we're humble people, but I mean, I was just always, whatever I did, hockey, baseball, oh, whatever, oh. you know, I was just one of those natural athletes. Oh. Um, and I think most guys were, uh, right. that have played in the, like you have to have some form of athletic you know, natural talent. Right? right. So, um, yeah, it was, and I was just always good. So it was always just the goalie, but now that I'm older, I play beer league forward and it's way more fucking fun. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Go I on. like scoring goals. now. Yeah. There you go. So <laughs> we're, we're going to jump around a little bit. We're going to talk about your mental yeah. health issues too. But at that time when you're growing up as a kid playing, we have any mental health issues back then? Not that I recall. I mean, looking back, I was always an anxious kid. Um, right. you know, so I was always, I was probably, pre predisposed to having um you know an anxiety disorder uh, i guess you could call it i don't know if you want to call it that but yeah I, I was just always on the go right i was that kid that that got home from school played road hockey until the street lights came on and it, it wasn't like i played once a week i played every day like i was always had to be doing something always had to keep busy always had to right. keep doing something always into something right but i wasn't a bad kid i was i, I would consider myself a good kid in school right. i wasn't a great student but you know, had focus issues. Like, right. uh, so I don't know if that means anything. Right. But you were never diagnosed with anything at that young age. No, right? no, it was, um, yeah, no. I, and I wasn't really, I, I don't think you could, uh, but if looking back, I was, yeah, I, I mean, there were anxiety issues probably when I went to play junior hockey. Um, I remember I, I had moved a bunch of times between billets, right. you know, always looking for somewhere to, to be comfortable and happy. Like I could never just stay in one place. So, oh. you know, that could be something. I think it moved four or five different billets. Uh, in, in like in one year? Or yeah, is... Well, I was there for four years, but okay. probably the first two. Yeah, about okay. four or five times. And then I finally, my last couple of years, I got with a billet that, you know, oh, good. I guess I found some peace there. Right. And uh, ended up winning a Memorial Cup with Kamloops. So that oh. was 92. So that was pretty, uh, again, uh, Niedemeyer, Sador, myself, we were probably, you know, that was, that was uh, our team. Daryl Sador. I played with Daryl Sador a little bit in Los Angeles too. Good guy. Oh yeah. Oh, you uh, would have played. So Sid would have been younger. So uh, yeah. Yeah. my first NHL win actually, Tommy was. Uh, where were you there? I was there in 1993. My first yeah. win was in the forum. Yeah, yeah, I was done. I was done by then. Yeah, you were done by then. Yeah, I saw. I saw you coming. Yeah, you saw. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's my claim to fame is that Gretzky's never scored on me. So. Oh, is that right? I only oh. played against him in one game. That was <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> taking the win. Don't tell anybody that. Don't just so say. I, I actually have that. a great story if we got time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'd never met Gretzky before. And then uh, last January, I was golfing with Russ Courtney, a good friend of mine. Him and Gretzky are on the same course at Sherwood in L.A. Right. And I went down there to visit Russ, and I was playing. Gretzky was in the group in front of us. And I was like, Russ, can I can I meet Wayne? Like, I'd never met him. He's like, yeah, yeah, we'll meet him in the, in the clubhouse after. So we go in the clubhouse. I talk to him for about 40 minutes, Gretzky, just the nice, just the nicest yeah, man. Yeah. You guys know him, right? Yep. And uh, I got to get up to go, though. I got a flight to catch in a couple hours. I got to get to LAX so because I got to go back to Vancouver. So as I get up, I'm like, Wayne, uh, really nice meeting you. And he knows I'm a hockey player, right? He says, hey, did uh, I ever play against you? And I said, actually, yeah, my first NHL win was in the LA Forum back oh. in 93 against you guys. Right. He said, did I score on you that night? I said, no. And I know you lose sleep at night over it. If you need a psychiatrist, <laughs> I got one for you. And I left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he loved that. He's got he a good sense. Like, oh, he's just, yeah. He was like, Russ yeah. told me later that, that Gretzky said to him, Corey might be the only goalie I never scored on. <laughs> That's right. That's funny. <laughs> but I'm taking the win. One game. I'll there take that. So after you left uh, Kamloops and you're done with your junior career, did you go right to the, did you go to the minors? I went to the minors. I played in Binghamton. So we had this great team in Binghamton. It was the Rangers farm team. 
we had 124 points. I guess we we broke the record for points in the minors. Like we, I was 35 and five or something was my record. Well, 35 and four. Yep. Yeah. So it was ridiculous how good we were, and and I and I was I just caught fire like for a couple of years in a row. Uh, and then we ran into uh, Ole Kolzig got loaned out to the Rochester Americans from the oh. Washington Capitals. Ole the goalie. Ole the goalie, right? And we couldn't score on Ole. It was ridiculous. Oh. He was, you know, Ole was at another level. And then right. so we got knocked out when we were supposed to win that year. But, yeah. That's but it was, it was good. I enjoyed, you know, minors. I played on some good teams. So, so that so how many years did you play in the minors? Then? Uh, I played my first year. I played for Bingo. Second year, I was in with the Olympic team all year, and then I oh. played my third season in the minors was with Bingo, and then I got traded to Vancouver, and then oh. so that was from there. And then I played in Vancouver. And then I was up and down the rest of my career. Right, uh, Vancouver, Washington, Nashville, Dallas. Uh, who else? I was. I went to Anaheim for a cup of coffee, but never got there. Got traded at the deadline for futures. Oh. And I think the future considerations ended up being a dollar. <laughs> yeah. So what about the Olympic experience? Where was the Olympics that year? That was in Lillehammer in Norway. Yeah, we ended oh. up with a silver medal. We lost in the final to Sweden. That was the Forsberg goal. So I was the oh. goalie that got scored on where Forsberg did the the oh. Kent Nielsen had never been seen on national uh, anywhere in television. Uh, God damn Peter Forsberg. <laughs> they made a stamp out of it, Tommy. That's what Tom was just saying. I didn't realize that. Wow. Yeah, so yeah. You're, you're on the stamp? I'm on the stamp. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a photo of it here somewhere. I probably have one laying around somewhere. So how many yeah, people they, can say they're on a stamp? Well, can, only dead people in America because you got to be dead in the U.S. <laughs> oh, is so, that right? Yeah. Is, is that a law? <laughs> I believe it is. I think oh, you have to be dead. Terrible. Yeah, but uh, no, I'm still here. Some oh. days I wonder how, Tommy, but I'm still here. Yes, yeah, she'll live forever. What are you talking about? Live forever. <laughs> So you bounced all over in your career. Um, well, let's yeah. get right out of that. So when you were with right. the Rangers in 94, when they won a cup, you were one of the black aces. You yes. practiced all the time. Yeah. And yeah, it's I at did. that point during the season, then that you started to realize that there was something going on with you. Well, it is. So I have obsessive compulsive disorder. So obsessive compulsive disorder is a little bit different than other things. It's, um, it's almost like something in your brain just kind of breaks like a wire disconnects. Um, and it's, you start getting, um, you know, repetitive thoughts. So the best way I describe it, Tommy, is we've always been, we've all had that thought where we're driving down a highway, we're going one way, cars are coming at us, it's single lane traffic, right? Cars are coming one way, you're going the other way. We've all had that silly thought of, well, what if I swerve my car into the other lane, right? It's just a mm -hmm. stupid, silly thought. It's just a thought. It means nothing. You're never going to do it, but it's like, we think a million thoughts in a day. For someone like your brain, um, which, by the way, probably has tumbleweed and a mouse, a hamster running on a wheel, um, you would just go home. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that jab. No, that's good. Keep going. Keep you, going. You would just go home and not think about it again, right? right? And just not think anything. Right. Whereas my brain, I would get stuck on something like that because in order to avoid something like that ever happening, which never would because it's only a thought, but for me, my brain would get stuck on it to try to avoid a catastrophe, something happening. Oh my God, if I did that, what if, you know, what people would be hurt? Uh, my brain would go into hyper overdrive of protection to the point where I would just stop driving my car. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the way OCD is the best way I can describe it. Now it, it's much more, you know, it's much more deeper and a lot more than that. Yeah. But you know, whereas most people wouldn't think about it, I would ruminate on it 24 hours a day, seven days a week to the point where it would, I get hit with so much anxiety about even thinking about it, that it would make me want to throw up and I would just stop driving my car. Right. So that's the best way I can describe it. So uh, during that playoff run, I was out and where something, like I say, just kind of, kind of broke, like the wires just, just disconnected. Um, and you know, from there it was repetitive thinking 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, never stopped, never left me, never, not one moment of peace. And I didn't know what was going on or what was happening to the, you know, and just every time you get a thought, it's like getting hit with a tsunami of anxiety, like to the point mm -hmm. where, um, I was pretty much debilitated because it was, it was just, it, it was, like I said, the anxiety is overwhelming and it's panic attack after panic attack. Um, so that's kind of where it started. So before that you were fine. You didn't really notice anything. No, I'm just maybe an anxious kid or whatever. Right. right. Whereas people with a depression and, and you could, depression can kind of sneak up on you. Anxiety is just something, you know, people, have, but like, you know, 
there's different mine is a uh you know you can diagnose it with with kind of how it is but you know bipolar schizophrenia those things are, are are a little bit different than ocd in the sense like i say i can tell you the day the time where i was when the wires just kind of wow. disconnected and you remember when you you know the old record player right when it would skip yep. you know that's what it's like in your brain cognitive you, rigidity just keep it just keeps repeating over and over and over and over and over oh. and over and you can't and you can't stop it to the point did, where did, did something trigger it did something happen that started it no i i don't know no not really i can't really i can't really pinpoint a, a, a time or, or or something um you know there's like you know it's it's another way to describe it so like you know someone that has uh ocd the hand washing right My well it's not about the hand washing it's the fact that they think that you know, there's something on their hands that, that they might touch people, they might give them a disease or something or have it themselves, and they continue to wash their hands. And here's the thing, though, is that, Tommy, as people say about OCD, they're like, oh, I'm so OCD, my house is clean and all that. Well, uh, you know, and that and that's so I don't I've got bigger fish to fry than than a fight over what, you know, language we're using. But um, you're not OCD, you know, in terms of that way, like most of my friends have that have OCD have a, have attempted, you know, uh, made an attempt at their own life. Um, and that doesn't mean you have OCD. That's what's going to happen. But when you don't know what's going on and right. you can't figure it out and you're getting hit like that, uh, it can be pretty debilitating while extremely debilitating. And, uh, you know, that's sometimes is where people think the solution is. So it's, right. it's hard for me to listen to somebody when they say, Oh, I'm so tidy that I'm, I'm OCD. Yeah. yeah you, you said that to me before and I didn't realize yeah. that until you mentioned that. Yeah. Well, have you ever not been able to leave your house for six hours because it's yeah. not spotless enough, right? right. Like that's yeah. OCD. Yeah, right. So or now you're in the middle of the playoffs. So people that don't know the National Hockey League, I think Corey and I both love the National Hockey League. We played in it. We were proud to do it. Great accomplishment. But especially back then, it was um, like having something wrong with you in any way, but especially mentally, it just wasn't accepted, right? I mean, people no. just there's nobody really to turn to for you. No, I mean, yeah, no, there was a, I mean, heaven forbid back then, even, even with you, Tommy, like you look back and your goalie's got a mental health issue. You'd be like, Jesus, yeah. you know, yeah. cause we yeah. didn't know, we didn't know any better. We totally. weren't educated on it. Right. Yeah. We were like, we saw movies and, and back then, you know, if uncle Joe had a problem, you dropped him off at the asylum and maybe you saw him again, maybe it didn't. Right. Sure. That was the solution. Yeah. So there was a fear attached to it of what it was like, but I'll tell you what, like I say, I always say Michael Phelps suffers from depression and anxiety, 23 gold medals. Right. Yeah. Like sure. it's so far from the truth, but back then that was the stigma that was attached to it. Um, right. And the numbers are, you know, 20% of people have a diagnosable mental health issue. So every Stanley cup team, every super bowl team, you know, statistically, just because you're a, a professional athlete, a doctor, a lawyer, right. I mean, you're not exempt from it, right? It doesn't discriminate. So right. if you think about it, statistically, every super bowl team and every 20% of their players have mental health issues, right? right. I think sure. the numbers are bigger. So again, you know, that was the stigma back then. And, and hopefully we're in a better place now. Right. So the Rangers are in the middle of a playoff run. Yeah. So, so it's not like you're thinking to yourself, well, everybody's going to be worried about me now. They do. People really I'm don't. Trying to hide. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to hide. Right. Like are you that, able to get to the rink at that, at that point? I struggled. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. going to lie. Like getting up every morning was like, was, you know, and trying to get through panic attacks and just, I, I didn't know what was going on. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, this is a mental health issue. Go see a, a, a psychiatrist or whatever. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Sure. All I knew was, is that something was wrong and I was getting right. So, so yeah, so the Rangers win the cup and I'm just trying to stay out of the way at that point. Right. right. Like, cause I don't want anybody to know or anybody to see, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm not telling anybody. I blew out of there the next day, Tommy. I didn't go to the ticker tape parade. I didn't go to anything, oh. but what did that make me look like? That made me look yeah. like an asshole. Maybe sure. look like a bad teammate. Right. But at this point but, you don't know what's going on. I don't know. I'm just thinking, get home. Just yeah. go home and, and we'll figure it out from there, right? Or maybe it'll go away. So, you know, long story short, uh, I get home, nothing changes. Uh, you know, a month later, I'm in Kamloops. I'm still living with this and and I'm to the point where I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I can't tell anybody. I can't talk to anybody. Mental health issue. And I'm like, fuck it. I'm done. And I ended up making an attempt at my own life. I took my car out to the back roads in Kamloops. Uh, there was a straightaway there. I, I and it had a left turn. And if you didn't make the left turn, well, you went over the edge. Right. But the interesting thing about that is, is that as I was, you know, it was midnight and I'd just been out with some friends, wasn't really drunk at all. Um, and when I went just completely blank, like no anxiety, no depression, no OCD, just zero feeling. 
right mm. and it was it was because it was like fuck it i'm done i can't live like this um so i was like okay well so i took my sports mm. car at a turbo laser it sucked you back to your seat every time you shifted gears and i was like all right well how are we going to do this and uh, uh i was like well i got a fast car i've never seen how fast it can go so i went up to that spot in kamloops i knew and i just hammered the gas probably got the car up to 120 140 miles an hour just fucking flying right like and just no emotion and probably about five seconds before the edge i, I don't know sliver of hope you know the thought of being mangled and living um is probably what stopped me you know and it just hammered on the brakes and just sat there bawling like begging the universe or god or whatever to help me and i went back home and i remember putting my arm around my girlfriend it was about two in the morning by that point and up until about three, four years ago, um, she was my high school girlfriend at the time. We were dating through that. She had no idea that I was 15 seconds away, maybe five from being a statistic. Right. So that was, you know, but I mean, thankfully, I did stop the car. Right. Yeah. Because all those things, all those great things that happened to me today, my kids, you know, um, everybody, you know, meeting you, being on the show. would have never go. happened. Right. There you go. Yeah. That's why I talk to people. Tell me, hey fuck it gets better like you can be in a really dark place right now but it uh it gets better so Corey, what what turned it around for you after that event so you you went you went home hugged your girlfriend yeah. and what happens well i mean it's the you know, long story short again i mean it's it's quite a convoluted long story but i just decided i was going to try to live with it and hope that i could figure it out right because at that point i would i you know that had happened and it wasn't uh um you know, whether or not I wanted to live, I guess I was just hoping that I could figure it out. So I got traded. Uh, I went back to training camp. There was a lockout that year. Uh, ended up in the minors. Ended up getting so traded. Corey, you're, sorry to interrupt, Corey. Did, did the Rangers ever say anything to you because you left? They ever asked no. you what was wrong or anything? No. Okay. Not a word. Not a word. Because they, they, they just thought I was a, a shitty teammate, right? Because yeah, okay. I'm late for stuff. Didn't want to hang out with the guys like because you, you're hiding. You're continually right. hiding. So you look like a bad teammate. Were you abusing alcohol at all? Not at that point. I was so into my own head that okay. at that point I, I, I wasn't drinking or anything because it's I I was so consumed by my own brain that actually drinking would take time away from oh, okay. you know trying to figure out what the fuck was going on in my brain. So thankfully, no. Um, but um, I get traded to Vancouver because Rangers think I'm an asshole as a teammate, right? right. At this point, mm -hmm. um, where I get a new lease on life. And Tommy, I, I say this: I still had to make the Vancouver Canucks, and I say this as humbly as I possibly can, I still had to make that team the following training camp sure. with a full extreme mental health issue going on in my head. I made the fucking team, wow. you know, right? So that's what I say. By well, no were you just learning to deal yeah. with it, you think? Is that? Uh, I was functioning, yeah, just okay. learning to deal with it. But hockey was my safety. Like, like, there's a lot of things about the culture of hockey that people are complaining or, or you know, that are saying that are the game's kind of under fire, especially here in Canada. But I'll, I say this, and people ask me, did hockey do this to me? And I'm like, Tommy, hockey saved my life. Right. Like, think of the skills it taught you, right? Oh, Resilience, yeah. you know, how to how to get through the things in the face of adversity, how to keep going in tough times, how yeah. to, you know, how to work with other people. Uh, hockey saved my life. Hockey's sure. a great game. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it so, is. Yeah. And that year I was on the NHL rookie team that year. Oh, were you really? Wow. I was. Yeah, I made the NHL rookie team, and I'm still struggling, right? Right. So, so again, nothing's been done. You've not told anybody. You're just I'm dealing hoping with to yourself. figure it out okay. and it'll just go away. Right. Right. But uh, my second year in Vancouver, mental health is like, hey, Tommy, you got to get it. You can't just walk around with a broken leg and say sure. it's not happening. Right. Mental health is the same. And, uh, you know, I was in New York um, when it, like, it, like I said, long story short, uh, brought back down to my knees where I was in New York, panic attacks so bad. I, I'm not functioning. I lost 30 pounds. I was 145 pounds trying to play in the National Hockey League mm -hmm. to the point where I finally had to talk to a trainer because it was back to not looking like a bad teammate, you know, dropping weight. Sure. Uh, Marty Gell and I came out of the shower once and he looked at me. And he's like, Hershey, what's wrong with you? I was 145 pounds, right? So, okay, so when somebody says that to you, yeah. a teammate says to you, what's wrong with you? Did yeah. you ever think at that time I can I've got to tell somebody like at that uh, time right now? It was getting close to it, yeah. But at that time, I'm still trying to hide, right? right. Like, sure. I'm still just trying to like because you know um, to the point where yeah, we were back in New York. It was early November, and I had to talk to a trainer and I asked the trainer, um, you know, uh, for help. And oh, 
and it wasn't quite that easy because I still was playing all the games because Kirk McLean was hurt. Mm -hmm. So we're playing in New Jersey and we're having a morning skate and uh, the morning skate, I can't see pucks. Like really? I'm having like an out of body experience. And I later learned it's called depersonalization where your brain's just fried. Like it's like a computer that's just fried, right? It's yeah. just, it's not functioning anymore. So I skate over to Tom Randy, who's the coach. And I'm like, Tom, I can't, I can't play tonight. I, I just, I, I can't, I can't do that. I can't. Okay. Now hold on for a second there. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. So that moment okay. when you finally say that to a coach, yeah. so you've got to a hockey person and you know, the hockey culture, and now you're admitting that something's wrong. I that had, like, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I had no choice. Like I, I was non-functional. I couldn't see pox. Wow. Right. Like I was non-functioning. Um, third, 145 pounds. Right? right. So he calls an emergency team meeting because he didn't know what was going on either. Right. Nobody knew at this point. Right. So I hadn't been diagnosed or anything. So in the locker room, we go in the locker room and Tommy, this was probably the most embarrassing, most shameful, worst thing that anybody could have done. Right. But Tom didn't know. He didn't know any better, right? right? They, nobody knew. So he calls this emergency team meeting. Everybody's in there. Russ Cordon, Pavel Bury, Alex McGillney, all the Yerky Lumi, guys that are. Sure. And he says, uh, and I've got my head and my knees in the corner. Like, I'm I'm done. Like, right? I'm, right. I, I should actually be going to a hospital at this point. And uh, he says, hey, uh, Mike Fountain's going to start tonight. Hershey's uh, struggling with some stuff. Make sure uh, if media asks you, just tell everybody he's got the flu, right? <laughs> so, you know. Everybody gets up. And at this point, I'm the, I'm the plague, Tommy. Like, guys don't sure. know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I get on the bus, and I remember looking out the bus, out of the bus window, and I was crying. And guys were filing by me one by one because I was like, I just threw my NHL career away. And at that point, I did. But I, I do say this, Tommy, is uh, I was the same day I saved my own life. Sure, right? yeah. Went back to Vancouver, saw a psychologist that the trainer had connected me with, got diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and then from there, you know, it was a battle. I, it was still a long battle, but, um, you know, it was 10 years before I found someone that could help me. And then another 10 years before I publicly came out with my story in the player's tribune. So mm -hmm. if anyone thinks I got sick next day, I went to the doctor next day, I, I got better and wrote an article. That's, that's not how it sure. happened, right? It was 20 years from start to finish from diagnosis, but I'll tell you what, this is what I fight for. And, and I know this has been long again, but it should have been like that. It should have been, I got sick, went right. to the doctor the next day, went and got help, went on with my NHL career. Right. right. And it's, it, the issue is, is we don't educate people and right. we don't talk to people. And, and back then, yeah, it was a, it was a death sentence for my NHL career, but right. that's how it should have been. Right. Have you ever talked to Tom Randy since that? Lots of times. Yeah. Tom and I talked and, and he had no, idea. like he didn't know what to do. No, he didn't. Yeah. Nobody knew what to do. Sure. And, and that's why I believe in educating. We need to educate our kids. We need to educate our friends, our family right. members. Cause I mean, the shit is real, yeah. right? right? Living proof of it. So uh, I've learned from you and from others, <clears throat> you know, similarly, if you break your leg, like you mentioned before, you go to the doctor, you put a cast on it, get it fixed yeah. and you're fine. It doesn't mean the whole of you is, is something wrong with you. Same thing with a mental health issue, right? You've got a problem. Yeah. Doesn't mean there's something wrong with all of Corey Hirsch. My brain's a physical piece of matter, right? sure. <laughs> but it's not supposed to break ever. Right. Right? They're supposed to all run perfectly. No, it's like, you know, uh, they our brains break. So we have to help people when they do. And, you know, it used to be, though, that, you know, the stigma was attached to it, that you were crazy, that you were this, that you were that. Um, and I feel for the people in the 60s and 70s, there's no treatment options and there's tons of treatment options out there. And I encourage people to go get help, you know, and Tommy, you and I talk about this, too. But being a man doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that you have to suffer in silence. Yeah. Right. Totally. Where in the dictionary does it to say under man must suffer in silence? Yeah, totally. In, in fact, you're a, you're a stronger person if you come out and get help. Right. Oh, absolutely. And right. you're better. Why, why suffer? You're a better person. You know, why walk around in life with a broken leg or, or, or right? you don't have to. We'll get Corey, it fixed. Corey, you said it was a 10-year process. Can you tell tell us kind of what happened, what you did to uh, yeah. deal with it? Well, getting diagnosed was the first step, right? Um, so I get diagnosed. But after that, you know, it's different treatment options and trying to figure out. Because, you know, if you get a broken, if you, let's say you hurt your knee, right? Um, you go to the knee surgeon, right? You know where to go. You go, but with, you know, where you get your shoulder, you go to the shoulder surgeon. With like uh, when you have a, a specific diagnosable mental health issue, well, I didn't know where to go. So it took me like six or seven therapists before I found somebody that could really help me with a therapy called uh, ERP. So you're trying medications, you're trying different therapies, but 
you know, you can't go to the knee surgeon to get your shoulder fixed. Right. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, you have to go see the, yeah, you, know, you got to go see the shoulder surgeon because they're specific, but because none of us were educated on that when we were younger or that you don't know where to go. So you're throwing darts at a dartboard. Well, who can help me now? Right. It's not like a one size fits all because it's, we're talking mental health. So it was way too long. And, and, you know, finally though, when I did find somebody that could help me, it made the most difference in the world. It was, it was incredible. And medication got on some medication. And, uh, you know, I talk about this too, is, is that, you know, there's a stigma on medication. Well, well why am I shamed for having needing meds for, sure. you know, for my brain, right? right? If I had cancer, I wouldn't be shamed. If I had diabetes, I yeah. wouldn't be shamed. Why am I shamed? I didn't ask for a mental health issue. Why, why am I, you know, I'm on meds. I'd rather be here and be a good person and, and be good to my kids and be alive sure. and not on meds. So, but you're going to shame me for being alive and right. make fun of me. Sure. Right. So that's another stigma that we, we could get into, but it's, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the Coles notes of the story. It's been, yeah. it's been a battle. Yeah. So that season that you told uh, Tom Rennie that you needed help, uh, that season was done for you then you didn't play anymore. Uh, no, I came back and, and I still, and I played, I, I kept playing through it. Right. So, so, so the teammates did not know what was wrong with it. No, I didn't tell anybody even after that, that I'd been diagnosed with anything. Right. right. I came back, I gained some weight, but by then I was, you know, I was the plague. Tommy. Yeah. Like everybody knew something was up. And, and so the article that came out in 2017 in the players tribune, I told everything and in all honesty, a lot of it was apology to my teammates back then. Yeah. Right. This is why I was the way I was. And most didn't know. Most were right. like, Corey, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Right. And uh, um, yeah, so it was. Uh, yeah, I didn't tell anybody because heaven forbid, again, yeah. I had to diagnose them. Now I've got a diagnosable mental health condition. If I tell anybody in the league, holy shit, like I am completely done. I'm not even going to play the minors. Yeah. Right. So that too, was kind of too bad. And that's, that's was yeah. the way it was back then, but it's too bad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I was a better player after I got diagnosed and got on meds and everything, but it oh. was too, yeah. But the stigma and all that was, was right. too, but we're in a better place today. So I want to encourage just because of the story, but I want to encourage people that it's not like that now. Right. right? So if Corey Hirsch was playing today in the national hockey league, you yeah. feel comfortable that you could reach out and get help and would not be. I feel comfortable knowing that I would know where to go to get help. I still right. wouldn't use a team. Okay, so and you're that's sad to, to say, right? <clears throat> but yeah. because I would still be afraid that somehow, you know, that would be an issue. And then maybe once I got comfortable and established, I'd feel good, comfortable because then then it doesn't matter. But if I was still trying to make the NHL or something, probably not. And it's I makes me sad to say that because yeah. it shouldn't matter, yeah. right? It does. It makes me sad to say that. But yeah. that's where we should have be able to teach players where to go if they need help if they right. don't want to use the team because it's honestly it's none of the team's fucking business right. excuse my language but right like if i if i get um you know a cold or the flu or something or whatever do i have to tell the team i no you know yeah. like it's my business yeah. and mental health is my business so they've got the is it the players assistance program they have now yes and i do and in all honesty like uh, with all of this said I do encourage players to use the the, the program if they right. can. Dr. Shaw and all that they do. Uh, it's confidential because these doctors would lose their licenses if it isn't. But I'm just speaking from my standpoint as a, if I was a player, I can understand why you would be afraid. Yeah. Um, but in the same sense, they do have the programs available. I do encourage guys to use them. I just know for me, I would I would still probably still be a little bit timid and shy about yeah. using a program that's with the teams but being on the outside now and knowing what they have um you know they've got some great things in place yeah think of all the careers out there too like pro sports obviously uh lawyers all those things where their mental stability is really that's what you know if you're a lawyer and you've got that problem right i did a we did a panel discussion chris nyland and i with some lawyers out of toronto and we were, had this topic you know the substance abuse and leaving early from the office and all those kinds of things. And, you know, talked about if you have a mental health issue, there's just no way they're going to tell somebody. So you think of all the professions out there, all the people that are afraid to tell people they've got to. Yeah. Well, but that's where we need to, to encourage people how to find their own help. Right? right. So that if they're worried within their own um, workspace or, or career that they can go get help and be better at what they do, but nobody needs to know it's nobody's business. Yeah, right. right? It, it really is nobody's business, but your own, but right. it is up to you to go get the help. Um, 
and and be part of your own recovery right yeah. so that, and I, that's another thing too right is you we, we want to help people and we want to talk to people and you know all i can do i'm not qualified to treat anybody but i can listen i can be right. non-judgmental i can lead them you know first place you go is your family doctor right. so i can help them get to that point but then after that it becomes you know up to that person to be part of their own recovery too right sure. you can't it's like you know someone with alcoholism well you can lead them to a, a rehabilitation center but if they don't want to go in but what are you going to do right sure. now do you consider yourself fully recovered now never I will okay. never be no, okay. um, because mental health is something I think we all deal with. Um, yeah. and I think we all deal with anxiety and depression, but it's something that I'll have to always sure. monitor and watch. Yeah. And it's something that I'll always, it's just what it is, right? There is no cure for what I have. Um, but I live a great life, right? Sure. Like, I mean, I live a fantastic life. I've got a book out. Um, I do a lot of speaking, uh, you know, Almost an award-winning uh, podcast too, right? Almost you know, an award-winning yeah. podcast. And uh, so it doesn't deter me from being living my best life. And, and sniping in men's league hockey too. Yeah, exactly. Right. Can, so, can you tell us about the book, Corey? Uh, just tell us yeah. where to get it. Yeah. So you can get it anywhere like Amazon, Chapters, Indigo. I think it's a Target in the U.S. Um, and it's basically, you know, people think it's a hockey book. It's not a hockey book. It's a mental health book with hockey stories in it. Right. What, what's of, the title? It's called Saving My Life. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's pretty powerful, pretty powerful book. Lots in it. And uh, I think that uh, I was the it was uh, eighth on the bestsellers list in Toronto out of Canada. So um, it's well, good job. It's pretty excellent. hard. Yeah, it's got yeah. a lot of information in it. So when you were at their worst of times, uh, I guess when you couldn't tell anybody, didn't know what to do. What did you see when you looked in the mirror? Oh, it was uh, what I saw in the mirror was uh, <laughs> good. Wow, that's a tough question. Um, I always felt like less of a man than everybody else when I was struggling. Like I'd go into the locker room and you see these big, strong guys, right? And I was like struggling, hiding things. Um, there's a lot of shame and a lot of embarrassment, a lot of guilt attached to mental health issues when there doesn't need <laughs> right. right? So now if I look at myself in the mirror, I mean, I see somebody that's been through um, – you know, a lot that, you know, has the strength to get through those things. So it's view myself a lot differently now than I did obviously 20 years ago as a kid. Sure. Do you love yourself? Uh, I try to. Yeah. Right. Like I think uh, that's a tough question too, because some days I look in the mirror and I had a therapist, uh, psychiatrist asked me that once if I was proud of what I've accomplished, you know, and, and I've, I, I think, I, I hope I've yeah. helped a lot of people, but I couldn't answer. Right. Why couldn't you answer that? Hard. I don't know. I couldn't say yes. I couldn't say no, though, either. Right. I just couldn't. I just was like, yeah. uh, probably, you know, it's somewhere deep down inside of me. I believe that I haven't done enough. I haven't helped enough people. Right. Wow. Um, and that's from my own self esteem, but I'm getting better. But that's something I practice, yeah. right? To love yourself and to be yeah. proud of, of what you've accomplished. Sometimes you, getting out of bed is a win. Sure. Right. But you do know you should love yourself, like wow. for what you've done in your life. Thank you, Tommy. You really should. Yeah, yeah. I, I do. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You see, it's even hard for me to sit here yeah. and it's like, right. Totally. But thank you. Yeah. Well, I've learned from Tom over here. He knows that I love myself a lot, but that's, <laughs> well, there's also too much self love. Yes. Yeah. There's a, you can just throw a little my way. <laughs> Narcissism. <laughs> I, got, I got a little bit left over. Not at all. You've always been one of my favorite people. You know that. Uh, right? Yeah. It's funny because we never even played together. So we just met each other yeah. a couple of times at uh, events and then we've uh, hung out all the time. So yeah. I got to tell a story about Corey Hirsch. So especially in the pro sports world, a lot of men, we just don't love tell, or like telling each other that we love, like say goodbye. And like, if I said goodbye to Corey, like Corey, I love you. We say goodbye. So we're on the phone probably what, six, eight months ago. And uh, before we get off the well, maybe longer, we got off the phone or we're getting off the phone. And uh, Corey goes, I love you, Tom. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but then it was great. You got into a discussion with me. And if I say this the wrong way, please tell me. But you decided along the way that, um, you know, you, you can't live forever. And if you've got people in your life that you really love, you should tell them you love them. I know it's yeah. a pretty simple concept. But Absolutely. Just, just, uh, Absolutely. And I, yeah, and I used to be like that. And then I had somebody close to me tragically pass away. And I was like, you know, like, I, I don't know when I'm, you don't know. Like, you yeah. Just, why, yeah, why hold back? You love them. And hey, hey, love you. And it's not like, you know, it, I just say, love you, brother. Right. Like you, yeah. and, you and I, when we say, love you, brother. Yeah, yeah love sure. you back. And that's right. And that's, um, 
it's just a, it's it's an appreciation of your friends, whether they're male yeah. or female, right? And the people that you love in your life, and that people are important to you. And, yeah, and it's like, yeah, I mean, I you know, I'm still gonna bury you in a in a wooden box, you know, yeah. one day yeah. if you yeah. if you ever go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never I'm never gonna die. I'm gonna live I know you're not. Yeah. Uh, no, never. but it's yeah, you know, it's uh, it's really yeah. cool. I, I wish more men felt comfortable. It, yeah, or even just saying to people, you know, like I'm really glad you're in my life. Like yeah. I started doing that yeah. more, like and the people that you really care about, right? Yeah. Exactly. And it's it's not a play on your sexuality. It has yeah, nothing to do with it, right? But as guys, it's like, yeah, it's hey, yeah. you know what? Yeah, it's all cool. Yeah, definitely. So what's next then? You get the podcast, book, what's up? I don't know. Next is uh just I've been doing a ton of speaking. I speak to uh <clears throat> You know, right now I've caught on kind of pipelines and construction workers, oh. that middle-aged man, right? That uh, oh. we really struggle with that uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't see getting help as being manly, right? And, and I'm out there to try to show people that, hey, getting help is, is manly. And like I said earlier, it's, you know, the, in the dictionary of man, does it, nowhere does it say must suffer in silence, right. but for whatever reason, um, you know, we've had all of that and, and, you know, I, I always say this, you know, with, with men, you know, we're taught to suck it up. Don't show your emotions, all that stuff. Well, you don't have to be a blubbering mess in front of your buddies, right? right? To be a, nobody said that, but Tommy, I say this, like, you know, your teammates are my teammates. Like if I had taken take in my life that day, do you think any of them would have come to my funeral and said, what a man, he sucked it up. He didn't talk to anybody, yeah. right? Yeah. No, you'd be like, why didn't he tell me? Right. Like, you'd be devastated as that yeah. person. So as a man, we all think that this, but it's the truth is, is that, you know what, going and getting help is being a man, right? Yeah, it really is. Yeah. 100%. Especially when you got a family thing too, right? Your kids. And yeah. Your kids, I got, yeah, I got for kids him. right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I'd rather be around for them. You know, sure. get the help I'm, I need. And, and sure. you know, how many kids did you have? I got three. Do you really? Wow. Yeah, I got three. I got my oldest is uh Colorado. She's a teacher. My boy's in Calgary. He's a techie guy. And my youngest is a ballerina. She's uh dancing in Stuttgart, oh, Germany. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you better, obviously, obviously like, they know all about your situation. You guys have oh, yeah. sat you've sat and had conversations about it. We were very open from you know when I was which brings me to another good story. We were very open from the time that my kids were were little about mental health because I knew what happened to me. Sure. Right. And we always had conversations in our house. And I and this is the importance of having conversations in your home because um I always told my kids, hey, if something funky is going on in your brain, come talk to me. Like, you know, you know what happened to me, right? It's all it's all okay. So one of my kids, when they were 15, I won't say which one, came to me and said, Dad, I'm having some some you know, issues and some thoughts and I don't know what's going on. So we took them to the psychologist, got diagnosed. That child got diagnosed with OCD as well. We know that some of it's hereditary and genetic and it can be passed along and part of its environment, part of its geneticism or whatever. But here's the difference. So she gets diagnosed right away, right? She will never end up in that place I did where I wanted to take my own life right, right. because you know, she came to me, got help, knew what it was, and then we got on and get therapy. And now sure. she she she's a teacher. Well, I guess I get cat out of the bag who it was, but yeah. you know, she's doing incredible. She's um, and we'll never get to that point because we educated in our home, right? Yeah. How simple is that? So you know? that's a good point, then. So for parents, it's worthwhile then to even if even if there is no issue, to go to your kids and say, "Listen, if you ever have an issue, you can come and talk to us." absolutely and you don't know you, you i can't can you see on my face that yeah, i have ocd yeah. right you can't i can't but my kids might be yeah, you have kind of a funny right? nose that your nose uh, is kind yeah, of, it's, yeah. it's that's because it's me and it's christmas and, oh you is know, that what it is okay play santa claus no there you go, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a good point right you can't see it in somebody no right? you can't see it so you don't know if your kids are thinking what right or what's going on in their head so so give them an opportunity be an open place where they can talk about anything and they can sure. talk to you because you you never know i mean the odds of you having a child that wants to go that route is pretty slim as it is i'm not saying but but hey wouldn't you rather know and be able to help them if if that's something that you know sure. is, um and that's what we that's why we need to open in in education in our schools and at homes and that because we never know whose life we're going to save isn't that true you think about schools right yeah. i mean it's we do so much we're trying to teach math and science and all these different <laughs> things but the mental health problem out there i think you were the one i quoted you said to me tom there's a, su a tsunami of mental health issues about to come oh. our way 
Oh, it's right. ridiculous. And it is. Um, so between 2007 and 2017, suicides went up 56% in the U.S. between the ages of 10 and 24. 56%, man. Right? Like we got to, these are our kids, 10 to 24. We got 10 year olds taking their own lives. Like, well, so this stuff, you know, part of the reason I do what I do is because I'm pissed. I wasn't taught this stuff in high school myself. Sure. How easy would it have been to teach me about obsessive compulsive disorder? Because once you know what it is, right. now I can go get it treated. Instead, I almost ended up taking my own life, right? Like, so why are we not giving that information to our children today? So why uh, isn't that happening? There's enough people like yourself out there talking about it. Why is that not happening in the school? Because, I, it, because there's two things. There's parents out there that would... Um, that, you know, if I go to some schools, there's the odd parent that doesn't want me to talk to their kid because I talk about suicide, thinking that it'll give them an idea about suicide, right. which is ridiculous. It's okay, been, yeah, touch on that for a second, yeah. right? Because some yeah. people do believe that if you bring up suicide, oh, yeah. they're going to yeah. kind of plant the seed. Some people don't believe in mental health, blah, 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 you know, all that right. stuff. Awesome. Um, but what it's been statistically proven that if you do talk about it and you do bring it out in the open, that it actually reduces the rates of suicide right. because you'll have a kid that's comfortable talking to you. So Tommy, like if I, if the, you know, you know, you're a kid and I, and I make it shameful for you that you're having these thoughts and I, and I'm, you know, you're, you're that much worse of a person for having these thoughts. Well, what's it going to do? It's going to bury you further under the sure. carpet and make right. you feel even worse than you already do about yourself. Right. So let's talk about it. Let's bring it into the open. Hey, people have these thoughts. That's not the solution. How do we find a solution for right. you? Right which is a lot better place than shaming someone for having these thoughts and making them, they're already suicidal, right? right? But the point is, hey, you know, sometimes you get parents at schools like that. The other is, is that the school boards uh, are still reluctant to talk about mental health at times. You know, we're getting better. Right. Uh, some schools are really good. Some, some well, are- But why would the school yeah. board, know, not knowing all those Liability. statistics- What's that? Liability. Liability. Wow. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, that they feel that maybe they're, again, the same stupid scenario, right? No. It's like, so it, until that changes and, and until we, we do that, I mean, you know, we could, but that this generation of kid is much better than, than we were. Like they talk yeah. about it now, they'll go get help. Uh, you know, parents are more open to it. Um, you know, like I said, my parents, it, you didn't tell anybody because you were, you were, you were shunned or you were, you know, sent to the, uh, sure. sent somewhere and had electric shock therapy and, right. and shamed for the rest of your life. Right. Did you finally tell your parents? Oh, I did. My, my, my mom was one of the first people I told. Oh, okay. So I had a great, I've got great parents, right? I can't, right. my mom. And so she was one of the first people I, but, but Tommy, she didn't know what to do either. Yeah. Right. Like, cause she had never been taught. She was just like, what do I do? Right. Yeah. Do I just, so she just tried to support and love me. Good. Um, you know, and, and that's, that was, you know, it was hard on them and parents blame themselves, right. you know, like, but my mom, my parents had nothing to do with me having other than maybe genetically, right. right. Which isn't their fault. Right. But, but mm -hmm. I, I give my parents all just, you know, they, they had nothing to do with them. Right. You learn a lot, don't you? Like if you see kids are maybe not kids, young adults or adults and they're acting out or maybe not doing things properly. And, and I certainly wasn't the past too. I was very judgmental. Like there's something wrong with this guy. Yeah. 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 Uh, the biggest lesson I learned was the day Sheldon Kennedy told me that he'd been sexually abused by his junior yeah. coach because I saw Sheldon in Detroit, this great kid acting up, you know, getting drunk, driving and motorcycle accidents, all this stuff. And I was being judgmental. And like, he came to ask me to represent him. I'm like, Oh, Dallas Drake was actually a client of mine. And I remember saying to Dallas, he's a bad, he's a bad kid. This guy, this, yeah. uh, Sheldon Kennedy. And then when he told me, I'm like, Oh my God, like you, now it all, uh, even at that point, I still didn't totally understand. As the process went along, I learned why he was acting out. So, well, typically, you know, people that I mean, not everybody, but most, you know, anybody with addiction issues, typically something traumatic has happened in their life at some point, right? Yeah, I, did, like, I didn't I, know that. Yeah, That's, yeah. Well, you don't grow up and go when you're six years old. Hey, I think I'm going to be an alcoholic. That sounds like right. fun, right? Yeah. Or yeah. hey, I, you know what? I think I'm going to try heroin when you're six years old. Going, I want to be a heroin addict, sure. when I grow up, right? Or you, you, that doesn't happen. So something has led to that point of self-medicating because that's what you're doing. That's what Sheldon was doing with self-medicating because sure. yeah. he had this, 
you know, and um, I, I did it too. Tommy, I remember uh, after my first NHL game, we tied Detroit 2-2. And I knew who Sheldon was because I played in the Western Hockey League against him. Okay. And we went out after the game. I went out with a bunch of guys. And Sheldon was at the bar that we were at. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at Sheldon. And one of the guys kind of tapped me on the shoulder said, uh, hey, stay, stay away from that guy. He's trouble. Nah. Well, that, and he was talking about Sheldon, right? Nah. So nah. then years later, you, you learn what happened. And you go, Jesus, right? Here's yeah. a guy that, that had that reputation that um, I can't – and for anybody out there that doesn't – his coach sexually abused him in junior right. hockey for five years, right? Yeah. I can't imagine even, you know, how he was still alive oh, after. Man. Like just, right? It's um, – and that's that's the thing of we need to stop shaming people that have addiction right. issues. Right. But again, Tommy, it's that person, we can help them. But at some point, they have to be part of their own recovery sure. too, right? So, so let's, let's say you got a young teenager out there. Yeah. And you see that they're acting up in, in ways you're going like, that just doesn't seem right. There's a good person. They're acting out. Yeah. Is it too easy to assume that there's something that's gone on with them or? There's a reason usually. Okay. But is that person going to tell you? Right. A, right? And B, what, like, what what is it? And it's. Right. It's hard to get somebody help that's in a situation if they're not ready to get help. But, yeah. but typically, yeah, there is something behind it, you know. And and there are there are issues, um, you know. I believe that sometimes you know people just aren't the best of people. Yeah. But I would say for the most of it, you know, like something has gone on, yeah. something's happened, right? Yeah. But it's again, you know, you can't force anybody to to get help, and you can't force anybody to tell you. But but what you can do is be an open book, right? right. Unjudgmental. That, yeah. Let that person know, hey, you can come talk to me about anything. Yeah. And typically, when you open up about your own stuff a little bit, that's when someone will share with you. Sure. Well, Corey, since you wrote the article, have any players come to you and said, hey, I'm just feeling I'm going through this. Can you can you help me? Or I've had quite a few. Yeah. Mostly, though, it's um, it's been a parent. Like uh, there's been a few GMs and a few scouts in that and then about their kids. Right. And then I've also had agents and, and some players come to me. Yeah. Um, which has been great. You know, that's, sure. it's been, uh, it's been really, it's been, uh, that's very rewarding. Um, but again, like I said, I, I so I, I just try and lead them to a place. Um, Hey, you know, first place is your family doctor. Second place is getting referral to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, and you know, from there it's, you know, it, it's, it's going to be up to them to get the help. Is that 988 hotline just in the U.S. or is that in Canada as well? Uh, I'm not sure what the hotlines are, but there's there's one for the U.S., there's one for Canada. I'm yeah, it's, sure. it's 988. It's a new number here in the U.S. It's 988. It started, oh, off being, yeah, yeah. it started off being for suicide prevention, but they've expanded it now that it's just all mental health issues. Yeah, yeah. And that's and those numbers are great. And those are, you know, if people could use them, we could get people to use them. Um, but it's all it all comes back to education. Right. let's educate our kids so that when they're our age, uh, especially your age, old man, uh, Tom Laidlaw. I'm getting younger. I'm getting younger. <laughs> I, don't know what you, I do not know what you're talking about. Delusional. Younger. Yeah. So that we're not in a place where we're sitting here going, oh, mental health. Like we don't even have to have this conversation right. because people are getting help and they're getting treatment. But I, I would really like to encourage our governments and everybody and people to, to have more grants and more, uh, sure. money funded towards um, our youth becoming psychiatrists, psychologists, um, you know, mm -hmm. so that because right now we don't have enough people. People are asking for help and the wait lists are long. Do you believe in stuff like uh, hypnosis and meditation and those kind of things? I believe in whatever works for you, right? Fair for enough. me, uh, OCD is a little different. It's tough. I've tried a bunch of those things, but um, there's plant medicine like psilocybin, uh, ketamine. There's lots of treatments like that that are. Have you tried? Have you tried psilocybin? Uh, I've tried a few psilocybin, no, but I've I've had done. Uh, I've, I've sat with ketamine. Uh, I I sat with a, a medicine called Bufo. Uh, Is which, that the toad poison? That's the toad one. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, I'll be honest, it was probably the most incredible thing I've ever I've ever really? done in my life. Yeah, it was. Uh, um, they call it the God molecule, right? It kind of shows you the universe and what it's, you know, what we're here and you get, and it's the answers you get. And it was, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot for me to process still. That was only maybe a, a few weeks ago. Like it was a little, it was actually quite recent. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was one of the most incredible things I've ever done. And it's, wow. I, I could sit here and try to explain it to you what it's like, but it's different for everybody yeah. when they, when they have a treatment like that. 
Um, it's not something you would go and do recreationally, right? right? It's a ceremony. It's, um, it's, yeah, it's quite. Um, a, a buddy of mine, a Navy SEAL, had uh, problems with alcohol. And uh, he did a uh, toad poison and the psilocybin and uh, changed his life totally, totally different. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's what we're seeing, like with people with PTSD and all that. It's something I look into, um, but it's not, I'm not going to sit here and say it's a cure for anything for me. Um, but it's something that helps. It, right. it definitely helps. You had said to me one time, kind of apologetically, that there's sometimes you just kind of take off and you don't like, you don't return yeah. phone calls for a while. Is that still going? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. I, I always think of people and then, you know, I try to, I, I try to be more assertive in that sense, but you know, it's, it's like, you know, Tommy, it's like, if you haven't heard from me in a while though, you'll, you'll yeah. reach out because yeah. that's what friends do, right? They'll, yeah. they'll be like, Hey, Hershey, you doing okay. I haven't heard from you in a while. So yeah. I have friends like that, that they haven't heard from me in a bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that I can, I can go into hiding. Right. Yeah. And I think people with mental health issues can understand, but, but it's actually worse for me when I do that, when I start to isolate and go into uh, hiding, because right. it actually makes things worse. Right? right. When, you know, when I should actually be more engaged and more active because it's, it's hard to explain, but yeah, self-isolation. That's why COVID was so shitty on everybody. Yeah, because no isolation is a massive recipe for depression and anxiety. Yeah. So, yeah, it's um, yeah, but like I said, you know, you know, you're going to hear from me eventually. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Well, I wish uh, Tom had a mental health problem because I wish he'd go away sometimes. But you know, <laughs> um, I have plenty, Tom. We haven't got into that yet. Oh yeah. So uh, listen, when I ask you if you love yourself, I tell you you should love yourself. I think you're a heck of a human being. Uh, dealing with not just dealing with the stuff you're dealing with, but h helping other people too, right? You're, you're not just doing it for yourself. You're making making sure you're changing other people. So I think you're fantastic. So. Oh, thanks, but even you know, like I do a lot of that for me too, right? Like that's how I fill sure. my schools. But yeah. you know, and and I'll ask you this too. Like you know, when you come out of hockey, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how much time we have left here, but yeah. you know, when you come out of hockey, you're trying to figure out what the hell am I going to do now for sure. the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, it took me ten years to figure this out, but go help other people, yeah. right? No, Things yeah. come to you. They, oh they, yeah. They, they, you, they, isn't that true? Like you're helping somebody yeah. else, but you're making yourself better too, right? Yeah, By doing absolutely, because yeah. the game was all about us. Yeah. My pregame. What did I do? Did, what yeah. did I do to help? You know, did I score a goal? Did, what are they saying about me in the paper? Yeah. And then when you got out of the game and that's all gone, you learn. Yeah. The more I help other people, the more that comes back to me. Totally, and I really believe yeah. that's the meaning of life and everything. So I'm the same way. Since I started this whole True Grid Life journey like five or six years ago, I feel yeah. like I'm so much better about myself than I've ever been. Like you know, I love playing in the NHL. It was fantastic. I was proud of myself. But the person I am now is so much better than I've ever been. So you know, well, think about the people you've met yeah. since you've started helping, right? And oh, like totally. it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, like I said, it comes, I believe that it comes back to me tenfold when I, when I set myself out, when I'm, when I'm doing things individually for me, yeah. well, eventually you lose people around you and, and people see right through that. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, and it, it fills my soul to help other people. That's yeah. how I heal inside as well. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you've, you've done incredible things with what you're doing too, brother. I no, mean, it's, same same it's all about helping people. It sure is. And again, the title of the book is what? It's called saving my life. Um, and it's basically, yeah, there's, it's, uh, it's the story of, of me and there's some hockey stories wrapped in it, but it's mostly a mental health book. And, and a lot of it too, I, the feedback I'm getting is even people that don't have mental health issues or are, are, are it's helps them able to understand somebody in their family that might sure. help, right. And what it's like, but, um, yeah, so it's, it's that I've got the podcast blindsided, uh, blindsided is the name of the podcast blindsided with the Good. players tribune is the name of the podcast yeah we just wrapped up season two um so where would they find the podcast where is it uh anywhere you find them apple okay. uh spotify anywhere like that but um yeah that's, that's it's uh it's been busy it's been really busy right. and it's, i don't uh, i don't think i've been on your podcast i don't think i don't because because we have um people that have had pretty severe mental health issues former players oh, you, you, know, you don't love them that much Corey. Yeah, and it's uh, we'd have you on, but you're too perfect. Oh, Jesus. What are we going to talk about? <laughs> See, I I love what you. Just, I, I just love. Uh, good point. Good point by you. You know what? You're right. There's, there's yeah. no point having you on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. everything you do, it's like everything you touch turns it's, to gold. You're like, what is that? Is it Midas? Is that was that the? 
Uh, we're going to do a show with you every week. We're having you on more often. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll just keep talking. You know uh, that. I just want to get back to Madison Square Garden. That's what I want. Definitely. Get well, you know what? I'll, I'll hook you up with this. Jackie Di Piazza sets up all the alumni stuff. We'll we'll hook you up with that. Maybe so yeah. I'll ask you this though too, and I, an interesting question got asked. Um, where do you think that playing for the Rangers was the greatest thing that ever for you? No. Was it no, the greatest podcast. place to ever this, play? This no. podcast we're doing just is waking up thing. and looking in the mirror in the morning. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> People ask you know, me my favorite place to play, and I always say the Rangers, Madison. Well, Garden. yeah, Nothing. as far as my career, playing Madison Square Garden Nothing. was my favorite place. Yeah, no question. Yeah, but it, again, I love playing. But my, my whole life now, man, like you know, my yeah. sons raising my sons, the life we have now, helping other people, doing stuff yeah. we're doing, helping out Tom, just giving him something to do. Yeah, I'm failing. Just, yeah, yeah. Well, That's what cool. I'm doing now is better than any win I ever got playing yeah, hockey. Totally, isn't that true? Can't, can't even compare. Yeah. Right? I know. can't even compare yeah. and then people are always still like oh you're the hockey player you're the guy that plays." i know I'm like no i was the hockey player i am not a hockey player anymore. i know i know is that true like again that's it's weird because we think back about when you were playing and you touched on it earlier the hockey and, and our, ourselves individually that's all it was totally selfish totally wrapped up in our own careers right yeah and that's yeah. okay you know yeah. that's that's what it was at the time and yeah. um you know but now um yeah. We got bigger fish to fry, Tommy. Yes, we do, brother. Well, listen, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. You're fantastic. And I really do mean it when I say this. Uh, like, I just really admire you for what you've done, the person you are today, the father you are, all those things. So, And you know what? I love you. Right back at you, brother. Love you, brother. You know that. Great to have you. Aww. Yeah. Corey, thanks. Hey, thank you. See you, brother. This podcast, as we keep growing, Tom, they, these are just becoming more and more. That that was just awesome to hear yeah. his story yeah. and the, the, to put out there and what he went through. You know, that was yeah. incredible. Yeah, Corey really is uh, like he's kind of like an idol or legend or something. It's like not, not only is he helped himself, but he's helping other people too. The way he speaks, he's so knowledgeable about the mental health field. And uh, I just, I just admire him so much. You know, to come out finally like he had to. He talked about how hard it was to come out in the National Hockey League. Fantastic man. Yeah, and like you know, like again, his second. We talk about the second chapter of the after the, the yeah. planker, and another one. His was way more impactful than what he did yeah. playing net. You know, that's yeah. that's impressive. That's a good uh, yeah. testament to him. Yeah, that was a fantastic show. All right, grasshoppers, thank you for listening. We had a fantastic show. We'll see you next time. The number one selling product of its kind with over 20 years of research and innovation. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headache, eyebrow and eyelid drooping and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com.